Hello! How's it going? Hope you can hear me okay. Hi everyone! Uh, welcome uh, to this week's uh, stream. We are going to be playing with noise this week. I'm fascinated by noise, specifically the kind that you can control and, you know, what it, you can do with it and the way you can use it to generate worlds. Ultimately, I want to do a bunch of stuff with procedural generation, but I love the idea that something is not actually random, but deterministically random. And the idea that I can, like, you know, say, I liked number 404, and when I feed 404 back in, I get the same random output. So I want to start with uh, what was the inspiration for uh, that project this week. It's actually linked up in my current project in the channel, um, but I will pull this up. It's a uh, rectangular November, which is the name of the project, but uh, it's doing random terrain generation. So this is actual random terrain generation. These numbers are being generated randomly. Um, and so what's happening is, um, I want to play with what's called the diamond square algorithm for terrain generation. I've played with this before. Um, and I'll kind of show you what that means. And I'll, I'll jump into the code a little bit because I, I found this really satisfying to build. So yeah, it's uh, built using the diamond square algorithm. And uh, I'm going to pull the Wikipedia page for that because why not? Let's learn some stuff. Um, it's a really, really cool way of generating varied landscape or these sorts of, I don't know, like height maps, I think is the term they tend to use. Um, and the way it works is, uh, I think the visualization actually um, does it very, shows it very well. You start with a grid, and the grids always need to be sized 2n plus 1, so all the math works out nice. But you can see you start by picking some corner values, and then you average those corner values plus some random difference, up or down, into the middle. And then you take the middle, and you feed it back out to the edges. So you can now see that the edges are actually an average of the middle plus um, each corner, you can see, and then and then you'd repeat and you say, okay, so the first time I did it with a sort of stride of two, which means I went two over two down and then back two. Then you divide a number by two and you zoom in and you do it again. And so you get, you know, now you zoom in and you do the diamond step where you recalculate the corner. And then you do this until your step size reaches one, at which point you filled the entire array with random, with sort of data. And because every time you, every time you shrink your step size, you are also shrinking the magnitude of random variation. What winds up happening is you get this sort of, you get this nice kind of smoothed, but also smooth, but also varied um, effect. And it works really, really well for terrain generation. Um, and you can sort of control the, the size and the magnitude of that. Um, and so what I did is I took that and jumped in, I jumped into the code here. Forgive me, you can see my, my comment I left myself here on the diamond square thing. You can see uh, st step one, you can see this, but step two in the middle, then three at the edges, then four in the next middle, etc. Um, and let me jump down to the code that's actually doing this for me. So I have this idea of a grid with a size, and I'm setting up the corners, and then I pick a size, which is starting off is sort of the size of the grid, and then as the size shrinks, as long as it never reaches zero, I can do the diamond step and the square step. The diamond step is the one center, and then the square step is the four sides. And then you can just repeat that by dividing by two. And as long as your grids are two to the n plus one, so, your five, your seventeen, your one twenty-nine. I believe these are actually the the examples I do are one twenty-nine. Yeah, um, you, it will work, and the math will all work out nicely, and you'll end at one, and everything will be full. Um, it's pretty slick. Ooh, four oh four wasn't found though. Did I? Is there a four oh four, Brian? Hopefully, yeah, you can. Chime back in and tell me whether you're still seeing a 404. Um, but yeah, I, I just think this is a really cool effect, um, and I think it shows off. Let me, because it's being so chunky, let me shrink the size of my terrain to 65 and refresh this. And you can see, there we go. Um, you know, now it's half the resolution in each dimension. It's still a pretty cool effect. And I did some smoothing and some interpolation. I just think that's really slick so being able to pip through these 
Yeah, so it reminded me of other ways of generating these sort of smoothed um, terrain things. It partially because I saw this, right? And I was like, okay, this is really cool. Every time I generate a map, I'm really satisfied with it. But I'm like, well, what's over the horizon, right? Can I go to the other side of this mountain? Can I go out into the sea and run into another island? And right now I can't, right? I'm only generating this little square of land. Um, it made me think of, are there sorts of random functions that are continuous in this way, but also um, I can kind of explore in a distance and come back to where I started. So I'm not really generating random numbers, I'm generating a random world. And the answer is, yeah, there is. Um, and uh, the most famous version of this is Perlin Noise. Um, I'm not gonna read this page to you, but it's an idea of deterministic, but also pseudo-random, very convincingly pseudo-random noise. And the cool part about it is um, it's two-dimensional, so as you go through space, things smoothly go high and low, low and high, low and high, high and low, and it's um, it feels random, which does not mean it's actually random. I don't want to upset any uh, computer scientists or mathematicians here, but it has a very unexpected feel to it. It is smooth, so you can just go in one direction forever, and find a, and find a continuous smooth thing. And so you can take different versions of this noise and sort of stack them together and produce a smooth, very terrain feeling effect. Um, here are a couple, there's gonna be some examples in here, but you can see that the way it works is it's, they call it gradient noise. Um, and you can see it can produce really realistic stuff. It tends to match our conceptions of, of realistically random. So like these mountains and this water were generated. Uh, this is sort of a very high fidelity version of what I did, of what I did over here. But you can see that it, um, by taking, taking the random noise and saying, oh, it's height and it's, you know, it's a height map and we're gonna interpret it as terrain, you can make something really, really advanced. And as a result, uh, sort of see what's over the horizon. I'd love to make a version of this where we can actually scroll around. Um, and explore the world and maybe even find a cool spot we like and remember where that is. Um, imagine being able to use this to generate maps for a game or something like that. That's my goal. Um, we're probably going to end up using Perlin noise. Um, Perlin noise can be... Perlin noise... Um, eh, one thing to know about Perlin noise is it is still, I think, under some, uh, some uh, licensing restrictions. So we're not necessarily going to just jump in and use Perlin noise. Also Perlin noise is not the fastest algorithm. There is a uh, there is a uh, simplex noise, which uh, is like Perlin noise. Um, and it, uh, as it says, a lower computational overhead. Uh, so it might be a little faster to contribute. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've played with per this stuff in the past. I was even trying to find my old projects and I could not find them for the life of me. But I love this stuff and I wanted to uh, sort of resurrect it and uh, do it on the stream and share it with other people. Um, so we're going to probably take a look at a, a library to do simplex or Perlin noise generation and uh, then sort of plug that into a, a fork of our terrain generator and uh, build something that people can explore and play around with. That's the goal. So um, the first thing we're going to do is probably go try to find um, some implementations of simplex or Perlin noise. We could try to write it ourselves and maybe that's worth doing just to learn. Now, honestly, this pseudocode doesn't look very long. So maybe, you know, okay, this is the C++ function that supposedly generates Perlin noise. I'm gonna say, to heck with it, let's see if we can get this working in JavaScript. And then if we need to, we can bail um, and go, uh, we can bail and uh, go pull in a library if we get stuck. I think there's tons of libraries that do this for us in every language you can think of. I did see that someone uh, commented on, uh, just really quick, someone commented on Twitter when I linked to the uh, Terrain Generator project um, that they didn't, they were criticizing my function names. And I think rightly, uh, we've got, we've got a uh, lerp, which is a very common one. You'll see that actually lerp comes up in this uh, pseudocode for uh, Perlin too, uh, right here. <laughs> uh, but uh, LERP is frequently a short uh, term for linear interpolation to uh, just take two values and a number that shows where you are between them. Effectively, I call it like the slider. It's the fun it's the slider function. You've got two values and a number that represents where you are between those two values, and you return that value. Um, 
I wrote a couple other ones that I commented. I probably should add a comment for this one. This is a uh, grid interpolation, right? So this is color interpolation where it's going to take a red, a green, and a blue value and return those. Um, and then there's glurp, which I just thought was fun. Um, and that takes an entire grid of data um, and interpolates between two grids over a, a sliding value. And that's how I'm doing the sort of this effect where I'm, in, I'm slowly transitioning between two grids. That's using the glurp function. Anyway, I just thought that was an interesting uh, question and worth explaining. Um, so I'm gonna start. I think we should just start with a new project temporarily and play with a JS version of Perlin Noise. Um, so we're gonna jump down here and do a new project. We're just gonna start, I think, by doing a uh, uh, just a blank normal thing here. So we've got a... Uh, For Idiotis says, if you wanna see this technique taken to an extreme, check out No Man's Sky. Yeah, no, um, these things have been very well under, you know, very well, uh, and thoroughly uh, built upon to the point where someone is using procedural noise to generate, with, with one fixed seed value, to generate an entire universe, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, right, they're using noise, they're saying, okay, this planet at this coordinates has all these properties. And because they're using this, this deterministic code, as opposed to um, them storing at this coordinate, there's a planet with these properties. They don't have to do that. They can just uh, say, okay, hey, procedural code, at these coordinates, I'm gonna feed you these coordinates and you tell me what's there. It's very cool. Uh, Minecraft, another exactly, actually, actually, I believe Minecraft literally uses Perlin or Simplex Noise for its um, terrain generation. Like, they, it's exactly the, uh, the functions they used, at least initially. Um, uh, and obviously, yeah, you can get some really, really impressive results out of here. We are not going to do anything near that impressive in our the course of the next hour and 40 minutes. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I just think this is a great introduction to this uh, topic, um, especially if you like making games or think you might want to make games and are like, oh, the idea of level design, uh, <laughs> the idea of level design, like, fills me with dread, then, yeah, uh, procedural generation may be for you. It's the hallmark of uh, se several classes of game too, like uh, roguelike games. So uh, I created this project called Gregarious Icebreaker. And I'm gonna um, pop open the editor live view, make that smaller, and probably just zoom out once or twice. Uh, hopefully you all can still read that. Um, so right now uh, we are going to be in Pain Town because I presently uh, just dropped C++ code. <laughs> into a JavaScript file, and it's probably not going to run. Uh, and that would be uh, very unsurprising. So I'm going to real quick refresh this and confirm that I don't know if you can see down here in my logs, but uh, there, in fact, was an error. Uh, the word identifier or the unexpected token. Yeah, it's it's it doesn't like this. We're going to take the C++ and try to convert it into... Um, and convert it into... Uh, some JavaScript. We're gonna do a little bit of porting today. So I'm gonna really quickly drop the uh, drop a link to the project and update the description, which is Gregarious Icebreaker. Truly, really, what a name, right? I need to, I think I need a glitch, uh, a, a Twitch bot that will actually automatically do all this stuff for me. But in the short term, a little copy pasting never hurt anybody. Uh, cool, so uh, I dropped a link in the channel. You can jump in. Hopefully you can click that link. If it showed up as a link, maybe it didn't. Um, and hopefully if it did show up as a link, you can copy paste it in and just take a look at the project as we go. Um, you know, I do, I always love debugging help. If I make a typo, please call it out. Um, I'm, you know, only mortal. So we've got this function and I, you know, I'm going to add a, do another thing where I'm going to throw a canvas on our page. Cause I, I think that the best way of seeing whether your noise implementation works is, uh, by plotting it. So we're gonna throw a canvas on the page because once we feel like we think we've gotten this working, we're gonna draw it and see what happens. Let's say canvas class equals Perlin. Cool. Glitch should just transpile C++. You know, I could compile it to WebAssembly, but it's pretty short. So we're gonna just write it as JS. Okay, so I've done this a million times. Um, in fact, I think as opposed to, well, I don't have another project open, but uh, it's, I call it, they're calling it A and A1. I'm gonna call it A, B, and I like either T for time 
or uh, I for interpolation for my values. And we're gonna call this const. We're gonna make this write as an arrow function because it's really short and it's just one little, oop, and it's just one little uh, mat bit of math. So we're actually gonna rewrite this as an arrow function. Um, and we're gonna say it is A plus the difference between B and A times t. Uh, and so we're varying the numbers, we're going between two numbers, uh, a and b. a and b with t being the point between them. Um, and so really simple, you'll, you'll find, I think anytime you're doing any kind of like drawing and stuff, you're gonna want some sort of linear interpolation. Uh, oh, nice. How old that documentation was and how much better it could be. You know, you'd be surprised, Brian. I found that a lot of times when I go back and look at some of my old graphic code, because to get it working at like any level of performance that wasn't complete crap, you had to do a lot of stuff. I find a lot of it ends up being pretty close to how classical versions are written in the sense that, you know, you're not using a lot of functions. You're probably unrolling loops and doing stuff like that. Um, I find sometimes the older code can be can contain some surprising like aha moments for optimizing, even though it seemed like maybe it was written pretty shoddily. Um, okay, so we've got this function called dot grid gradient. This looks relatively important and I'm not going to necessarily understand how this works. So we're just gonna write it, we're just gonna port it. Uh, looks like it takes integers in, I was writing TypeScript, I could enforce that and it's returning floats computes the dot product of distance and gradient vectors. I'm gonna leave that comment because I don't actually know what it means. Um, Pre-computed gradient vectors at each grid nodes. node. Interesting. This is referring to a gradient object that we don't have. You don't know if you can see that, but it's pointing to, oh no, external flow. It's defining it right here. Um, and it's got three dimensions, the last one being two-dimensional. Okay, some constant values that are iy max and ix max. I'm just gonna um, I don't know what to set those to. Then maybe we'll go back to the uh, Wikipedia article for the time. I'm just gonna set them to, I don't know, literally, I'm absolutely making up a number. I'm gonna say 10 and see how that explodes. Um, okay, so they're defining a gradient and it's external. I recall you definitely had to do some sort of lookup in a lot of these. Oh, wow. Okay, look how different this looks from the example we had. I'm eschewing a lot. Of, oh, wow, Mauerbach, thank you so much from, for rating. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Thank you. Yay. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, we're playing with procedural noise. I'm eschewing the P5.js implementation on purpose. I'm eschewing all implementations for the moment and purpose. <laughs> because I thought it would be a cool idea to uh, thought it would be a cool idea to just try to roll my own, and I am realizing that that was a terrible idea. So what we're going to do is instead just go uh, find a Perlin library, as opposed to having people watch me uh, do these things on my own. You're saying P5.js also has? We're gonna search for that also. Sounds like there's actually a lot of options out there. So. See fast simplex, Perlin. This still is available. No, it's gone. Okay. Um, see, the reason I'm necessarily eschewing any of these implementations is because a lot of these are like, oh, it's part of a framework, and I don't have to. And then I feel like, oh, uh, hey, B. Cardell. The idea that, that it's inside of a framework, and then like, I have to pull in the entire framework and start learning how to use that framework as opposed to just generating the noise. That's the part that gives me the feels. Um, it's not necessarily that you shouldn't use a framework, it's that I don't want this to be about learning P5. I want this to be about playing with noise. So let's see. So it looks like our number one package potentially isn't available. Let me take a look. Oh, maybe, maybe it still works if it's still listed. The GitHub page is gone but maybe we can just play with it. 
forked and made to a common JS library. Here we go. That's why you need to read a little bit. Is this also an NPM library? I'm just trying to find like a web friendly version of this code. Hey, look at that. Okay, this looks amazing. This looks like very close to what we want. So, okay, it's generator configurations and generation. So um, let's very quickly, <laughs> uh, this looks cool. Let's grab this. Um, we're not trying to do WebGL right now. So we're gonna grab uh, a generator. Um, otherwise a random table will be generated. So it looks like there's some sort of special table you need to use um, and we, we are not generating that table. So, Let's potentially pull in this project. Ooh, there's a demo. Everyone joining me, we're now in the part of the stream where we are evaluating packages, which is I think always the least fun, uh, the least fun way to do these things, but also like potentially, it's never fun, let's put it that way. Oh, wow. I assume this is all Perlin noise. Oh, look at this. This is very impressive. I can hear my fan spinning up. So, does this export a module? Let's take a look. It does, look like it does, yeah. Is there just an index? Package.json, and then does this point to a particular file? Not really, but maybe it'll generate it for you. Ooh, AJ Piano, drop the link. I'm excited. We're at the point where we are looking for a library. Do, 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 do. Noise.js, I like the sound of that. Ooh, okay, yes, look at this. This is my, this is my jam. Oh, this is my jam. Just a JS file. I'm such a I'm such a jerk dork for just JS files. Oh yeah, look, there's even like a built-in seeding table and oh this is perfect. <sighs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, AJ Piano. Hero of the stream. Hero of the stream. Um I need a graphic for Hero of the Stream. One of these days I'll build that. Um Okay. Uh we are going to grab this file. Uh, and throw some credit in. Looks like there's credit at the top of the file. Fantastic. I want to make sure that if I'm yoinking someone's code, I'm giving them credit. <laughs> I just pasted the file there. Groovy. And now we don't need any of this, which makes me oh so happy. Nice. Nice hero of the stream. Look at this, look how simple this is. Oh, this is amazing. It's like they know, it's like they knew what I wanted all along and they just made a library that does it. Cool. So, now we can do let canvas equals, I have a canvas on my page. This is about to get pretty, folks on the stream. And I gave it a name, I can't remember what it is. That'll be fine. Let's see, dx equals get context. Groovy, okay. Noise doesn't think, seem to think that noise exists, but we know that noise will be brought in by the other libraries. We're gonna say global noise. And that will just shush my linter. Well, some of the time. Oh, it's because it's yelling about vars and a file that doesn't exist. We're gonna grab the noise script and drop it into our sample page. And then we are going to, let's see. They're setting an image with just some color. They had a demo that you did with Canvas, but we're gonna do it ourselves. Um, and then what were the uh, options? There was 
Perlin 2. Let's try Perlin 2. And then we're going to do um, let C2. We're going to do this the, the very naive way very quickly. Fill style equals RGB. We can, there's a much smarter way of setting the pixels of a canvas than what we're doing, but this is, we want to get to something visual and spare everyone. So let's do, copy paste that three times because laziness is a virtue. And then ctx.fillrect um, x, y, 1, 1. Complete darkness. I'm going to guess that's because this value goes from negative 1. So that's right there. Negative 1 to 1. So times 127 plus 128. Hey, all right. Now we're talking. Now we have a canvas, and it has some a blurry set of blobs on it. Success. Make that nice and big. Too big, probably, for our demo here. But let's do 256. Good enough. Okay. Nice. So now we've got blurry noise. Um... I know everyone's stoked. Uh, let's create an image data. ID equals uh, CTX dot get image data, if I can type. Data, and we're going to do the whole canvas, so 0, 0, 0. Um, and then... Now we have an image data object, which means as opposed to me doing this, which is really kind of dumb, drawing a pixel, um, we are instead going to say, uh, let index equals y times with plus x. And I happen to know that you, when you're Im editing an image data, there's four fields, red, green, blue, and alpha. So we need to multiply that index by four to the index into our data. And we can say, oh, and we also, okay. So we know that we want to convert from negative one to one to zero to 255. So maybe we say plus one divided by two, right? So now we're getting back to zero to one. And then we can do times 255. And then we know, I have to know that we need to, round that if we're going to use it in our um in our output so i'm going to do raft dot round cool so our value now is going from 0 to 55 and it's always a whole number you've got our index and we can say id dot data index equals value and we want it we're going to do grayscale for now so we know so the red is that value the green is that value the blue is that value and then Plus three, this is the alpha. We want this just to be full. And of course, we need to draw it. So put image data ID zero. That's gonna be, if I did that right, okay, I uh, over blew my color values, it looks like, and that's because my order of operations was wrong. There, there we go. Um, Cool, so this is way faster. Um, we're not gonna have nearly as many performance issues. Um, we can do, we're just writing data to a to an array, and at the end, we're pushing that entire array onto the screen. Cool, um, still just a blurry, <laughs> still a completely blurry uh, sort of modeled mess. And also, every time I refresh, I don't know if you can see this, it's changing. And that's because the seed is math.random. What if we just made our seed 0.5? So now we get, now it refreshed it once and this looks the same, but if I refresh it again, it looks like identical. And what that means is it's not actually random, it's seeded with a known value and we're gonna get the same random output every single time. 
I'm going to, I like this zoom size, so I'm gonna bump up my canvas size to 384. That fills this side window. Looks just looks nice. Um, okay. So this, like I said, it just looks like a blurry mess. Um, right now we're taking the X value and the Y value and dividing them by 100. Well, we could really do anything. What if we didn't divide them by 100? Well, if we don't buy them by the 100, it's actually so fine we can't see. Okay, so that's good to know. Let's zoom in a little bit. Aha, now you can see it looks very, it looks very, uh, you can see that, but it looks very, no, it looks like white noise almost, but it's not. Um, we could do divide by five. And really, if we're gonna be taking this number, we should call this, I'm gonna call this number zoom. And we're going to say, let zoom equals, we'll call it five. For now, I think that sort of shows you that it's how this noise sort of spans off into resize my canvas. It should prove that keeping things consistent like a snapshot into a visual. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I have another way I can show that, um, which is every time I refresh, you can totally, see that it's the same thing but let's move around this is the cool part about this in my opinion is that we can actually move right we can move in this space and go in any direction forever and see more noise and by by, by forever i mean as good as our numbers are <laughs> our numbers will fall apart right you know we live in we live in a world where we have 32 32 or 64 bit integers so let's define this function that does drawing as frame right as if it's as in frame of animation, because I want to actually fly around this world a little bit. So uh, we're going to say let px equals zero, let py equals zero, and those are just going to be our position within the world. And we can say px plus x over zoom, py plus Y over zoom. And now we're actually gonna be in the world flying around. Um, we add, let me re actually call frame once. And then at the end of our drawing cycle, we can also request I know I misspelled that. I'm just gonna finish typing. Okay, so request animation frame frame. Now we're just really intensely drawing the same thing over and over. So let's each frame figure out where the heck we are. We no longer, I don't think we can do this outside. That's nice. You don't have to re-get the image data every time just to redraw it. So let's say px equals, um, to start, I just want to run. <laughs> and by that, I mean, I want to say, let's start time equals date.now. I just want to move in a direction, but show that we are moving in a direction. So we're going to say px equals date.now minus start time, and let's say divided by, I'm going to guess I need to divide that by 10,000 because that's available in milliseconds. And I picked a very slow number, and it's almost impossible to see on the stream, but we are moving. So let's um, speed up. Let's speed up more. All right, I don't know if you can see this. But now we are actually traveling. And despite the fact that the, it's a little jerky, um, probably because the noise is slow to compute, we'll profile this in a minute and figure out why it's kind of slow. But um, I can even go even faster. Now we're moving so fast, it's hard to tell that anything's even happening. But okay, so now we're traveling. Like I said, it's a little chunky. This is where I'm gonna see if I'm just gonna switch this to simplex two noise and see if that's faster to compute. Um, not notably, but it's maybe a little faster. Um, I do wish that was a skosh smoother. Obviously, you can. I don't know if you saw when I switched between Perland and simplex, but there's a much um, higher, there's a much like higher contrast with the simplex noise. So maybe we'll go back to Perland for the time being. It's jerky on stream. It's definitely smoother when you're not uh, running OBS on the same machine. Um, but yeah, I'm happy with this. Um, okay, so we could, of course, let's call this let 
t. Let's just define a time function or a time value. That's the position through our time. Because we can say t, we'll call this t over 100. And we'll say py equals t over 200. And now you can see we're actually doing. And then I'm going to zoom back in and do like 50. Too much zoom. 20. Cool. So you can see we're traveling through a random world. Um, and it's, you know, not the greatest thing in the world. But, um, not the greatest thing in the world. But I will say that, like, this is just continuing, right? We're constantly generating new numbers. We're not in this thing where we're worried about, um, we're not in this mode where we're worried about, like, figuring out what's over the edge of the horizon. It's almost like this Perlin world has always existed and we're just moving through it. We found it and now we're exploring it. That's the thing I love about, you know, procedural randomness or procedural noise is the idea that, like, this field of bumps has always existed. It's all been there since the dawn of time. But we found it. <laughs> I don't know. There's something really, really exciting about that in a really dorky way. Um, you know, these, this math has always been there. We get to explore the world. The world of, the world of 0.5. Okay. I, I don't know if you can tell, but this is just, like, smooth. And I don't know that if we turned this into terrain, like my other example, what that would look like, right? I don't know if that would be satisfying at all. Um, but we can do that. Let's go grab a little bit of my uh, voxelification code, or just rewrite, let's rewrite the voxel code, because um, I find that to be satisfying. And the voxel code works on a much smaller subset of values, right? Because we want to, the voxels have size. Plus, I think voxels, as an aesthetic, need to make a return. Um, my personal opinion. So as opposed to, right now, we have this grid of pixels. What if instead of having a grid of pixels, we had a grid of just points? So we're going to say, let, uh, let, um, it's going to call it scene equals new. I like the idea of... Let's call it, let's use, make a float 32 array and let's make it um, 32 by, th well, 64 by 64. So that's 49496. Um, so we're making an array and that array has X and Y. And because it's 32 by 32, we're going 32 by 32. We have this value. And right now I'm doing a float32 array. So we can actually, instead of doing all of this nonsense, we can just store the original Perlin noise values in there. And then we can just say, um, let scene index equals uh, y times 32 plus x scene so now I've got values from negative negative one to one being stored in an array on every frame um, and instead of this is where this this is where this gets fun um, and instead of uh, drawing by using put image data. We're no longer going to do that. We're going to draw our scene. I'm going to write a function called project. Project is going to take um, the X and Y of the array item and return them projected into our canvas. Um, project right now, we'll just say return X. We're just going to default to returning X, Y natively. So this pipes through and we can say for and now we can loop again over our world. If I can do this right, there we go. I'll just duplicate this whole loop. What is wrong with me? There we go. So we're doing sort of a two n squared thing here, which is you know, not the most efficient thing. That's okay. Um, so we know our value that val equals scene, say let idx 
equals y times 32 plus x uh, scene index. You have our value. Canova, thank you so much for following. I appreciate it. And we're going to say let x, we're going to say let cx, cy for canvas x, y equals project. And the project, it's going to project um, our x, y, and the value. And then we can say ctx.fillrect cx cy. And actually, I'm going to say um, z or height. Say h for height. You'll see why. It's going to be cx cy. Yeah, uh, that should be one height. So I just wrote the world's most terrible voxel code. Glitch absolutely has request limits. Have you been uh, mashing? Uh, right now we have sort of static request limits. Did you, do we hit the request limit for this project or are you uh, seeing it elsewhere, Brian? Um, okay, so we don't have any errors. But we also don't have any output. I can kind of deal with that for the moment. That's a bummer. Hopefully it's, hopefully we've gotten back on the uh, train. I think in the stream and in my, oh right, because I'm in the side window as I'm typing, everyone's seeing the same thing. Wow, maybe I need to get the request limits raised when I make projects for a stream, which would mean making them ahead of time. We'll get there at some point. Uh, okay, uh, we have this function called project. Uh, right now project is, like I said, returning exactly the same values. Also, it's not really, oh, I'm not returning an H value. That's why we're not seeing anything. Let's just say 10, so I can make sure this is working. Great, we have a bunch of squares. Looks terrible. So now we're actually gonna do the projection. Oh, and we actually need to project to that value. So we'll say, we're gonna pass it an X, Y, H. And we're gonna take back a C, X, C, Y, and an H. Okay, so. Um, we now can figure, do the projection. I'm gonna do the isomorphic projection because I think it looks rad and it shows off the voxel ness of everything. So we're going to do that now. Um, the fastest way I know how to do that is to switch into polar coordinates and back out. So we're gonna say let uh, theta equals math dot eight and two. So actually we're gonna say let, um, um, let's call this, uh, this is the center X. We want to find center or shifted center X. So we're going to say center, center X, or actually I can mod just mod these numbers. So we're going to say X equals X minus, um, 16, Y equals Y minus 16. Um, we're going to center the coordinates. We're going to find the actual, you know, we're going to take these instead of going from zero to 32, we're going to go from uh, negative 16 to 16, roughly. Um, and then we're going to say, let theta, math, math at 8 tan 2, y, x. Um, 8 tan 2 is a nice, fun, fancy, modern version of tangent, or uh, arc tangent, where it automatically assumes you're trying to compute an angle, as opposed to doing blind arc tangent. So it's returning a, an angle in radians based on that. And we can also say uh, distance, and we can say math dot hypot because yes, six gave us the hypotenuse function and we can pass it X and Y and that returns the distance from zero to zero to X, Y, super cool. Now we can say CX equals, it's gonna be um, canvas.width over two plus distance times math.cosine of theta Okay, and then CY is canvas dot height over two plus distance times math times the sine of theta. And then we can return CX and CY. And if we do that, we get a square centered on the screen. Uh, let's rotate it. Now that we have the idea of theta, we can actually rotate theta by um, 
let's say 45 degrees, which would be math.pi over four. I got that right. And we can do the same thing with the sine, which we absolutely will have to do, or else it's gonna look weird. And now we've got diamond. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's not very, I will say it's not very, uh, you know, what's the what's word I'm looking for? It's not very big. Um, so we actually need a scale here, a scaling factor. Um, so we need a scale, it's really just the distance between, it's the difference between the, uh, I'm just gonna do the math for it. Um, let, let scale factor equals, um, and it's, uh, the scale factor we want is something, something like uh, canvas dot width, because our canvas is a square, so we can do canvas dot width divided by um, math dot high pot 3232 divided by two, which will give us a nice centered scaling factor. And so we actually need to do distance times factor. And by doing these multiplications, you're gonna see that all of a sudden it's gonna grow and maybe I actually need to not divide it by two. Oh, it's not divided by two, let's see what we get. Did I get that right? I did, cool. It's a little off the top. Um, one of the things we can also do is make it projected into the distance. So we can say for the Y, we can actually say scale factor over two. Yeah, now we've got some isometric looking nonsense. Um, and also, um, looks like our bars aren't quite wide enough to overlap. I'm gonna manually fix this by just making them wide until they overlap. Okay, that's not probably correct, but that's how we're gonna do it. And we'll center them on their position. So this looks still dumb. <laughs> Uh, what happens if I just pass in H? Oh, I don't know if you could see that, but it kind of did a weird thing, which is, I don't know if anyone could see what happened there. But it did a weird thing, which tells me that we are not doing uh, zero, zero. Okay, we're back. Whoa, I don't know if you can see this. Um, it's definitely moving very quickly. Um, and we're gonna just slow it down because I think we're very zoomed in now. So I don't know if you can see this. It's a very subtle effect, um, which means our height values are not being scaled properly, which is totally true. So we could um, say times 10 plus 10, let's do that. Take a look at this. Now we actually have the beginnings of a voxel effect. It does, it actually looks like a cool spotlight effect right now. Um, we're now actually traveling over a sort of gently, very gently height mapped version of our, uh... okay. I think this part, we're gonna pause right here and just take a look at how rad this looks. I think this looks incredible, but it's very hard to see, other than the fact that it's undulating, it's very hard to see um, what's going on. That's because every bar is right now the same color. So I think we should fix that. We know the values go from negative one to one, so we can say, let's say, let color equals val plus one, times 127 plus 128. And then we'll say, as we've been doing, RG, well, uh, RGB, duplicate that three times, close our back tick. Now we're getting somewhere. Okay. So now we are traveling through a, a like a universe of height map. Also, are, vo are voxel effects the best or is it just me? 
I think voxel effects are the best. There are millions more efficient ways to draw voxels than this. Um, I just love the idea of the sort of height map effect. Yeah, so this looks cool. I'm pleased as punch with how this looks as an example of uh, moving through a noise gated world or a sort of noise generated world. And what's cool is right now this is procedural. <laughs> like the part that's not obvious is that every single time this page loads, everyone's traveling through the same set of bumps. Right? That that's it makes me very happy. Everyone travels through the same world of bumpy lines. And that means that like we all are kind of in the same mathematical world. I'm a dork, but that, that appeals to me. Okay. So you can see it's resetting every single time. I'm gonna uh, slow down the uh, travel rate even more just to really accentuate the fact that we're moving. Right now, is this is this like does this look like terrain to you? Because it doesn't really look like terrain to me. It looks kind of like terrain, but not really like terrain. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it turns out that modeling realistic things is not... My, modeling realistic, like, objects in the world using Perlin noise. Um, point six universe really has it going on. Oh, you, you left my universe. Thank you. Um, the... Like modeling, um, so modeling real world things using uh, Perlin noise is a lot like modeling music using sine waves, which is to say, sure, you might be able to match the frequency, but you're not going to match the sort of harmonics, right? Um, like a piano doesn't sound like a sine wave, and terrain, real world terrain, doesn't look like Perlin noise. However, if you take enough sine waves and stack them together in the right way, you can make something that sounds like a piano. And if you take enough pieces of Perlin noise and stack them together, you can make something that looks like terrain. Um, so a lot of those cool examples were not just taking one harmonic of Perlin noise, they're taking many harmonics of Perlin noise. And that's what we're gonna do now. So right now we have this, you're directly calling this thing called value, but we actually want to do is sort of saying, I'm going to say, um, we're going to say world at point and take those same and pass in these same values. And as opposed to returning um, one value of noise, we can return many values of noise. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Noise, Perlin, so we have a function called world at point x, y, and we can start by returning exactly what we started with. So right now, it's not gonna look any different whatsoever. Um, and that's okay. Um, but what we're gonna do next is, as opposed to just taking this one, what if we did the following? noise.perlin2 plus xy over 2 plus noise.perlin2 x perlin2 x let's say times 2 y times 2 over 4. So it's I think a little bit subtle. Um, so actually, actually let's make it way less subtle. Let's do this. So now you can see there's sort of an underlying undulation. And maybe I even turn up that undulation. I say times 0.7, and we make this one times 0.3. And now we have, oh, the project has received too many requests. <gasps> too popular, too cool. The shame, let's keep coding um, while that's being taken care of. So you have this idea of harmonics of noise. And you can see a harmonic is sort of a frequency shift and it's a amplitude automation, moderation. Um, and so we can actually encode this as a list. We're just gonna do it like this for time, for now. We've got sort of a times 10 and a, a times 10 that's tiny and a, tie, and a normal harmonic that's sort of tall. Um, and I also wanna make sure that if these all, if these add up, they always add up to 
one, right? The absolute, if Perlin, if, you know, each harmonic was all at one, when we added them all together, we want to make sure they're scaled so they hit one. Um, it's not the same as octaves. It actually might be the same as octaves. Um, the idea of Perlin noise octaves. And I think some of these libraries actually refer to the idea of octaves. Um, and there's, you know, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's an example in one of these that talks about octaves. It may even be... But yeah, it's the idea of taking different... Um, I'm using harmonic and octave interchangeably. Probably all of my harmonics right now are octaves, which is to say they're kind of multiples of... An octave, I guess, is what? Times two, right? Uh, so really an octave would look like a power of two. Right, because it's twice the frequency, so it's an octave. Um, but yeah, harmonics, octaves are a type of harmonic in this case. This, for all of its jumbledness, is it's, uh, is actually a uh, is actually a probably more realistic looking thing. So, but you know, because we've got this sort of big harmonic that's moving very slowly, and this small harmonic that's moving much faster. And you could flip that, right? I could say the big harmonic moves very... And now we get a very choppy thing. And you can just mess with these. You can just mess with these all you want, and the more you stack them, the more you can potentially, like, create something realistic. So we could say 0 0.5, 0 0.3. Let's just stack three harmonics. And maybe at some point we'll code this up so let's stack up times four, times 0.8. Let's make sure those never sum to over one. And you'll start to see this starting to look a little bit more like terrain. I don't know if, I don't, at least in my opinion, it is. Where we've got these sort of long rolling, you know, changes in the terrain. And we've got these short kind of and maybe we even flip this where it's 0 0.3, 5, 0 0.2, right? And now you can see that this maybe looks more or less mountainous to you, where there are some sort of long changing waves and some much shorter, faster changing waves. Um, I like our grayscale just fine. You know, I'm not going to sit here and come out against the grayscale. The third line isn't factoring in yet. Oh, thank you. No wonder I wasn't getting the effect I wanted. And this is why it's good to have people on stream with you. There we go. I think that actually does start to look a little bit terrainy, terrainish, terrainish. I don't know what you want to say, but you can see we get kind of low and we get kind of high and maybe, you know, now we're kind of in a plateau with, you can see where there's sort of a much lower area in the past. Yeah, I think that's kind of cool. I want to make sure our coloration right now is accurate. Yeah, that looks right. Um, so what if we did a terrain coloration? What if I jumped back to my previous project for a moment because I had some really nice, simple gradient code in there? And we're going to take... Got to add it. Um, we're going to take this function, which does... Actually, I guess we need, we have a lerp function, we need a color lerp function, and we need our gradient function. Um, and I know I'm copying some extra stuff in here too. That's okay. Um, but we're gonna very quickly drop those in, uh, remove, <laughs> remove the word glurp, which we're not using in this project. But now we have these functions that can take a, a, a list of gradients. Lerp is not defined. Are we not doing, we don't have a lerp in this file. That's right, I deleted it. Um, so I'm going to take all these utility functions and actually put them in the page. Because I want that same cool color. Um, I want this to be in our Perlin world. And so we are going to add all these in. It may actually move these to the top of the file so they're not in the way of our program logic. We're just up here. And then I'm going to go grab the definition of my terrain gradient. I was very, ha I tuned this one for a while. I think it's sort of 
produces something that's a little bit realistic. Um, and that's this line of code right here. So this is a gradient for taking our grayscale value and projecting it into something that looks a little bit like terrain. Okay, so now instead of having this grayscale map, we can do the following. We can do, so 2RGB is a, is a function that I have, which takes the gradient of my terrain grad, which I believe is a terrain grad or terrain gradient, terrain grad. And then we know our value is going from zero to one on the gradient. So we can take val plus 0.5 or val over two plus 0.5. All right. So now, I mean, it's a little coarse, I would say. And maybe even more than a little bit coarse, but take a look at that. We're not really getting deep oceans or big mountains in this part of our world. But you can see that we're moving through a sort of voxel world. And maybe we need to up the, uh, maybe we need to up, so we've got, you know, down here, we have our camp, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say const size and make this 32. And maybe we can up the const, maybe we can up the size. And these don't have to be powers of two, right? Like, but maybe we can make this a bit more detailed. I'm going to quickly find all my 32s in here and just replace them all with this variable. I think that's the big ones. And then somewhere I think there is a 16 where I had just done size over two. Yeah. You know, I always know that's gonna happen, but uh, you always know something like that will happen where you make an assumption and then you need to change it to a variable later. Let's just double the resolution to heck with it. It's actually still running okay. I'm gonna turn it down to 48 to save my computer. There we go. And then also, I think I might actually increase that scale. Maybe I won't. I think this looks really neat. Um, but now we've got this sort of voxel world that we're moving through, and it's got mountains and valleys, and you'll notice that kind of, Every time we start, oh, I refreshed my whole editor. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. There we go. And every time I start, um, we sort of start in the same place, which is right there. You can see the sort of a lake system that moves off into the distance. But we are proceeding through this world. And we can even change the speed with which we proceed through this world because we had done that already. So I'm going to actually turn up the speed with which we fly through. super noisy at the edge. It's kind of dizzying at the edge, actually. As opposed to going height, I'm just going to do like 20. I think that'll look a little bit less weird. Not much less weird, not going to lie, but 20 was necessary. You can see that we are kind of zipping around in this world. Um, let's see. Why well, I sort of have some assumed numbers in here. We can change our zoom. Right? Right now our zoom was at... We've actually zoomed out. We can zoom way in. Ooh, okay. So zooming in is where it's at. And then we can slow the world down again if we're zooming in. Ooh, I think that's a happy medium. I think that's a well-tuned set of parameters. Look at that. You can see the, where the water is and the shoreline and some hills. I also, it's weird that we're kind of going, it's kind of going away from us. So I'm gonna flip the direction that we travel. Just, that's a personal thing. It's, I don't like that we're, I like the, I want, I want this, the effect to be heading toward us and not uh, away from us. That's just a personal thing. There we go. Okay. I think this looks really sharp, 
But, like I said, we're not really getting... I want there to be... Maybe we can even change our harmonics now a little bit. Maybe we say... Times 0.6, 2, 1. And give that fundamental harmonic more. General Tic Tac, thank you so much for following. I'm not really clamping this, but I could turn the fundamental harmonic kind of over the top, right? And actually, you know, get so we can, we can go below zero and above one. Not a big deal. I think my maybe even my gradient code can handle that case. The gradient code handle that case? It totally does. So we can intentionally exaggerate things. Also, we can exaggerate the the terrain, right? We that's all we control that. So I can say gradient times 100 plus 100 110 maybe. And make our hills really something. So something that they're going right off the screen. times 80 plus 100 maybe. And we can, looks like we need to shift everything down. We can do that right here. I'm just gonna shift everything down, plus 100. We have sort of a, okay. Now we have got, I feel like now we're kind of explore. This feels like we're more like exploring a map, doesn't it? You can see that there's these like bodies of water and hills. And maybe we want one, maybe we actually want like a low harmonic that's a little jagged or a high harmonic that's weirdly jagged, right? Maybe we can say X times 16, make like a really, really jagged one and make it that much more varied. And so, yeah, this is like, maybe animating it is like, Maybe animating it isn't what you want, but I love the idea that we can just like completely customize this world. Well, this is nice. Now we're getting like little islands because you've got this very jagged, sort of nice texture in it. We haven't seen any high mountains in this section of our world, but that's okay. What if I didn't? What if I just said we are live? We are at date dot now. We can do that. Now we're in a completely different part of the world. Completely, you know, we are much, much further from, and now every time we open this up, we're gonna be in a new place because we're, now we're just linked to time. If you, if you looked at this tomorrow, it'd be a completely different place. If you look at it at time zero, it'd be a completely different place, but it's never gonna be the same place twice because we're always moving forward in time. And now that we're super far away from zero, zero, I'm not gonna get any effects of the harmonics stacking up. Cause we didn't put our, we didn't give any, our harmonics any phase. And so right at zero, zero, it's all the same value and then they diverge. But look at this. Because we're using the set map, exactly, Brian. That's one of my favorite things about this, is that it's the same place every time. There is, you know, um, it is persistent from run to run, assuming you keep your seed the same. And so if you were, and the best part is, that means that if it's, you know, I could put the coordinates of our location in the world on the screen, and if you were like, my world's got a little jamble there? Um, like, the fact that, I, you know, maybe I could add the coordinates of where we are in the world to the screen and we could, you could share them. If you found a really cool place, you could be like, check out this really cool place I found and sent me a link to that location. A thing we could totally do is take this and take maybe this plus some, this and like WebSockets code, right? And so every person, everyone in the channel could be somewhere on the world. And if you wandered up to someone, um, we could share, you could see that they're there and each person doesn't have to, you know, share a copy of the map. The map is, the map is math. The map isn't, you know, a big file containing math. Oh, you're good, Brian. Don't worry. Um, um, let's say I wanted to have like sort of oceans. And for that, I'm actually going to do a times 0.01, y times 0.01. And we're going to sort of have this idea that now this is kind of be hard to see but it's the idea that 
in some places there's going to be a lot of land, and in some places there's going to be a lot of water. And we'll do 0. 0.5, and then maybe we'll do a 0. 0.3. We'll turn this down to 0. 0.2. Maybe this is back, maybe now this is our fundamental harmonic. And now there are going to be parts of this world that are much lower and parts of this world are much higher. And you could stack these harmonics forever and we could generate sort of a master world map that was way zoomed out, maybe just a color map that would let you see this. But now there's sort of these long, big fundamental waves that are governing whether we're like on a continent or on, you know, on a continent or on a dry land. I'm going to go back to using the relative time because I think... I think the relative time really emphasized the fact that we were going to the same place every time. I, I liked that a lot. Right, so here, 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 right? It's the same thing every single time. This is zero, zero. This is the origin, the origin wetlands. Um, and now, if I zoom out, it's going to look really weird. This is exactly the same view, but we are just... Okay, <laughs> this looks ridiculous, right? This looks... Because we're, so we're so far zoomed out now that you can't actually see what the heck is going on. We'll zoom back in. I think 50 was my good one. So we're back to our sort of home territory. Uh, I could really crank this up, right? Let's 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 trash our computers. Uh, I'm warning you. I'm about to turn the size up really, really high. Like, ex how can we look at the world's flat when it's like a deep dish pizza? Exactly. It's got thickness. It's got that that heft. Um, I'm going to crank this way up. Fair, I, I apologize for your computers in the short term. It's going to be super finely detailed, but also super slow to render. Yeah, the large world looks really good. <laughs> um, I can also zoom back in. So what we're going to do is we're going to... Um, one of the things I want to do now is I have these like projection scale factors. And I can just do this and start to fill the screen with even stuff that's off screen, but sort of fill the screen with voxels. Yeah. This is my jam, personally. I think they're right here. This right here is my jam. It doesn't seem too slow. I agree. Um, I think I said my machine is doing a lot of screen capture, extra work. And so it's a little chunky on my machine. We're getting lots of frame stuttering. Um, I'd be curious to see, actually, let's fire up the performance tools and see uh, what's going on that's causing all the performance chunking on my machine. That should be plenty. Lots of style recalculation, which I wouldn't expect. So we're going to see if maybe we, there's some stuff that we can, we're going to see if maybe somewhere in here we can see what's expensive. Okay. So in this snapshot I've taken, you can see that, okay, most of the time is spent in DOM. I don't know if you can see that, but <laughs> most of the time is being spent on DOM. And what that means is it's probably being start, it's probably being spent because I'm drawing those rectangles, calling fill rect. So we could change this to use image data and get a lot of performance out of it. We could switch to WebGL, obviously, and get it to, you know, go through that much more work but get to that much more performance out of it. Um, but it looks like, you know, 77% of the time is spent in frame. That's good. That's what we expect. 37% um, of the time is being spent in DOM. I think that means Canvas code. I can actually split this out and say show Gecko, Gecko platform data. And you can see it's going to show me a ton more sort of worthless information. But the flip side is you can now, if I drill down on cost, 100% of the cost... Frame request, run script, frame. 
you can see we can see what's spending costing so much of the time here frame set canvas look at that 15 percent of our time is spent setting what color we're drawing <laughs> that seems uh, the other thing we're going to remember the like canvas is stamped down to the end on canvas that's definitely a thing we could do uh maybe, maybe actually maybe we can spend a minute right now switching this maybe to image data that might be nice so now we need um to here instead what we actually want to do is first of all we want to clear our image data right between frames this is the part that's always annoying um we do want to clear it between frames so we could say um, each frame, as opposed to doing this, we'll say id dot data dot fill zero two d five white. So everything will be fully transparent white, fully opaque white. Um, and we can actually switch if I comment out this code right now, and we're still looping sort of pointlessly. But if I then say um, ctx dot put image data zero zero you'll notice that it's going to just draw white every single time uh, we're actually going to make this code slower and more terrible in the short term i'm going to shrink back down my um my size function my size value just because it's my computer personally getting crushed so i'm going to uh oh right because i'm putting image data it's clearing the screen Ooh, and because I changed my scale factor, let's just set, reset all of these things. Fantastic. Okay, back to where you were. A little bit smoother. Um, we're gonna write this code in parallel. At the last minute, we're gonna pull the switch and see what the difference is. So we now get to say, um, draw, correct. We're gonna pass the image data, CX, CY, um, width, Y minus H, we're just gonna do this. And then we also need a color. So let's um, pass in a color. So we're gonna say gradient Let's take this value and say let I see I had two different things going here. So we're going to do val times, oh, so this takes the value from 0 to 1, so divide by 2.5. Not using color anymore. Let color equals we back to showing a pretty thing. I think maybe it's important to show the pretty thing the whole time for everyone. So draw rect is not a function. I agree. Uh, ID X Y with I color. Cool. So let's do four. First, we're going to say x equals math dot round x, y equals math dot round y. Because when we're working in image data, we actually don't have the option of, we actually don't have the option of, um, uh, what's what we're looking for? We don't have the option of, uh, oh, I'm blanking, um, working in floats. We, we could write our own, like, we could write our own, like, anti-aliasing code, and that's not going to happen. So we're just going to take all these numbers and just convert them into, convert them into whole numbers. And then we can say, or let... less than with ooh and these should all be j 
Editing loops without causing an infinite loop. Always tough. There we go. Okay. Let. In, so we're going to say if x plus j is less than 0 or y plus oh, x plus i y plus j is less than 0 or uh, x plus i is greater than one or y plus j is greater than id dot height minus one do nothing right because we're outside the bounds of our we're now outside the bounds of the, the array and we shouldn't be messing around in the array so we're just going to say continue which is a which is the sort of move on version the array version or the sorry the for loop version of next <laughs> right it's just like next and nothing to do here. Nothing, no good will come of it. We'll format this pretty. Okay, so assuming we're actually within the array, we can now compute the index. And we're going to say uh, that's y plus j times id dot width plus x plus i, the whole thing times 4 because of the way that uh, these values work. Assuming I did my, oh, the whole thing times four. And then we can say uh, id dot data idx equals color zero. So we're adding, we're setting the uh, red component to the red component. And then we already, we don't need to, we're going to set the green and then the blue. And we don't need to set the alpha component because we filled the whole array with 256, 255 uh, to start. And so that's fully opaque. So this function takes an image data object and draws a rectangle. I think that's cool. So right now, underneath the hood, we're drawing rectangles. We just can't see them. So now the moment of truth, everyone. This is the moment of truth. I'm going to comment out this drawing code. We're going to see nothing. And I'm going to uncomment out this code. Look at that. Look at that. We are now doing the image data version of this, and it still doesn't seem like it's that efficient. But I'm very pleased because it should be, it ultimately will be way more efficient. I think we still have a lot of GC happening, um, and that's okay. But this looks way better personally i know on the stream this is all chunky as all hell um hopefully you're playing with this locally and you can see get a little water celebrate replacing one piece of code with another all right um let's see we are where else where else could we be burning efficiency here CPU went down the tubes. The CPU recovered, AJ. G piano. Um, I'm gonna take another recording and see where we're spending our effort now. Seems okay here. Might have just been a network hiccup. This looks different. I don't know if you can tell, but I think we've moved. You can tell these bars are all way smaller. Why did I delete the previous recording? Um, but you can see that. This looks different. I know it's hard to see. Part of that might be because I'm not capturing the right thing. So let me make sure I'm capturing the right iframe here. Take another recording. Yeah, that's the right iframe. I'm just gonna grab this bit right here. And you can see, I don't see that same, I'm gonna re remove platform data. I think we're spending just less time. Brian Arner, you said it looks super different. What are you seeing that looks different? The big test here is if I crank up the size of everything, do we do we get, you know, if I crank this back up to 128, do we 
is this more performant? Oh, yeah, no question, first of all, on my end. No question that this is more performant. And it's going to get that much more performant because I can make these bars narrower, like much narrower in a second. And we're going to do a lot less drawing. So first of all, I'm going to zoom back in because I thought that looked cool. Sorry. Zoom back in. I thought that looked cool. Ooh, and now we're getting chunky. So let's figure out how we can draw less. Looks like these bars they only need to be maybe, maybe they need to be six apart. Maybe they can be smaller. Maybe they can just be four. Four has a very different aesthetic. You can sort of see the diagonal effect. Oh, the perf graph looks super different. Yeah, uh, your fans probably did crank up because now I'm doing stuff on the CPU that was being done half by the GPU. And I was like, I don't need your stupid GPU. Uh, who needs a GPU when we've got a CPU? Um, and so you can, you know, we're definitely, we're definitely uh, doing a lot more hardware or enough more. We've thrown a bunch of the uh, efficient hardware math that way. Who needs that stuff? There's a good chance this is not performing better on your machine. There's a chance that we are just running square, right face first into the performance uh, cap of what we can do with this without hyper optimizing it, right? Because when we were doing the Canvas 2D code, some percentage of that was happening on the GPU and now none of it's happening on the GPU. I'm manually writing pixels to your screen. There is still a lot of overdraw, which means, right? So there's a chance that we can actually just do less. We theoretically this should be having the pixel drawing work and hopefully on steep slopes, you won't be able to see the gaps. Right, that's doing half the drawing work. It's super pretty. Um, also, fit, to, to be completely fair, uh, I'm running this, my CPU is a like super maxed out, like, you know, new Mac, new Mac mini with like pro configuration. Uh, if you're running this on your laptop, your mileage may extremely vary. Um, there's a chance that I am just just absolutely crushing one of your CPU cores. And if you're on like a dual core machine, it's gonna be the worst. I'm gonna actually pull this up on my phone and see what this does to my phone. Glitch.me. There are there any questions in the channel? I feel like this is kind of a cool stopping point. So I don't want to uh, necessarily go any further on today's stream. Um, I just think it's a cool effect. But I do want people to ask about what we did today because I feel like this was kind of out there. But I think this might be the right spot to stop today. I'm gonna zoom out real quick. Um, if you zoom out, you can really see what happens when you zoom out. Uh, and that's partially because my zoom code doesn't affect the height map at all, if that makes any sense. Um, my height is not being affected by the zoom the same way the, the horizontal axis is. Um, really, this should be almost like times zoom times 1.5, probably plus. Well, actually, I could just say maybe zoom times two. Yeah, the, the, Brian, you asked. You're asking the question just as I'm coding it up. Uh, yeah, we're absolutely. I'm I'm taking the height map and connecting it to Zoom. You notice that the second I did that, like things got a little bit. Uh, we got a little bit of a, uh, like the map shifted. So let me get that recentered. There we go. So now the height map is actually connected to Zoom, um, and that means I think it should be linearly connected, which means if I zoom in, yeah, see the. It actually gets much taller and kind of goes off the screen. Um, and if I zoom out down to like 10, it's much, much more mild. And you're really seeing the, like the limits of the voxel resolution when we zoom out. The cool part is we can actually zoom out even further now, right? And just see a world map almost. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that, but there's sort of this, oh, that's super interesting. Okay, so first of all, there's one thing I want to tweak. Px plus x minus. I'm actually going to do.
y equals negative oh no i need to make these the right nut uh i want to do something because i don't know if you noticed but there's like a massive ocean right next to us if there appears to be like a massive lake right like on the map that we just were like standing next to and we couldn't see then i want to see if we can get over to that map so i'm gonna move us a little bit Like so. What did I mess up here? Too many prints? Too many prints. And so, yeah, this is this is kind of out there. But you can see that there's all this like outer detail. Whoa! Now what you're seeing is like aliasing effects, which is actually equally upsetting. <laughs> Personally, <laughs> the aliasing effects are really kind of upsetting. I wonder if I zoom out, we can get around them. Point one, why not? Yeah, there we go. We've zoomed out past the aliasing effects. You're still seeing them a little bit, but it's not nearly as bad as it was. So now we're zoomed incredibly far out, and we can zoom back into like I don't know, 10 was 10 felt nice. Yeah, there's 10. It's interesting. I don't see water anymore. That snap. That snap um, is the uh, like aliasing effects of like our sampling of the voxel points and like the phase of the high frequency perlet noise. And so when we come into phase, you all of a sudden get this like very clear image. And now that we're zoomed back in, you don't see it as bad. Um, yeah, that was that was something. Zoom in one hundred. I guess there really isn't that much water in our in this section of our world. And I blame the fact that I have this very low harmonic that I can actually clean up. And then we can actually travel the opposite direction and go find some water. So let's travel, first of all, let's travel diagonally. And secondly, let's travel the opposite direction diagonally. And I think we're going to plunge into an ocean. Or a much wetter section of the map. Yeah. And I saw that because when we were zoomed out, it looked like we were traveling away from the map. Traveling away from water. And so now that we zoom out. Yeah, so now we're traveling into a, a wetter area. So cool. Ah, I love this. Okay. Um, that's definitely where we're stopping this week. And by definitely, I mean maybe we'll do one more thing. Which is, I'm going to want this personally, so I'm just going to do this right now. Input type equals range. Min equals, say, 10. Max equals 100. And that input is going to be zoom. Yeah, you, you know what's up. Being able to like go jump in and see what the heck is going on in this map. It's gonna be the best. I'm so excited. Oop, wrong code. We're gonna say zoom equals let zoom slider equals like mid time. And we'll say and I'm going to start that at 50 because I think 50 is like a super nice starting zoom and then start it off for sit and then we'll just say Zoom slider dot event listener input be super lazy about it and do that on change also. 
And now... <laughs> I make that zoom slider wider so we can get that finesse. That finesse. Um, and the way I'm going to do that is... I'm just going to make it wide. So... Just make it three pixels wide. Yeah. So I'm gonna real quick do a uh, and let's rename this project. I'm going to move that fish. Sometimes I need to move the fish. Position Y top. I do it. Yeah. Cool. So let's close this. Let's pop it out to the full window. See what we got. See what we're working with here. Okay. First thing I'm noticing is I want to take my label. And do that. There we go. I'm happy with that. And then actually, I'm going to say uh, canvas with let's say uh percent max with maybe that's good there's no no sense not growing a little bit if we can and done Maybe I'll put a better step on that. Very smooth. So you can really zoom out. All right. We're done. So what did we do this week? We uh, played with terrain generation and Perlin noise. Uh, which was, in my opinion, a ton of fun. Um, and we've made it so we can sort of fly around a virtual world. I'm hoping at some point we find a super mountainous region. But I think we're done for this week. Uh, thanks for joining me.